And now, Doctor, to get back to your game of whist at the Bagatelle Club. Yes, uh, this was the adventure Holmes always referred to as the case of the lucky shilling. As a matter of accuracy, it was more than sheer luck that enabled Holmes to win with that particular coin. Oh, uh, but to begin at the beginning, it was a lazy spring morning in the late 90s. I emerged from my bedroom with a well-developed case of spring fever. <laughs> Which Holmes jolted you out of. <laughs> <laughs> he did indeed. Before I had time to down my morning coffee, he bustled me into a handsome cab, my revolver in my pocket, and the scent of adventure in my nostrils. Holmes was cold and stern and silent. His brows knit in thought and his thin lips drawn into a sardonic smile. A sure sign that we were on the prowl in the dark jungle of criminal London. Holmes, do you have to look so sinister? After all, it's a beautiful spring morning, the buds are budding, the birds are singing. And one of our well-known young men of our town has unaccountably disappeared with a not inconsiderable sum of money, Watson. His mother sent me a frantic summons early this morning. Turn in here, driver. Park Lane. Number is 427. 427 Park Lane. That, that sounds vaguely familiar, Holmes. Yes, we've been there before. This is the house, driver. Here you are. Keep the change. By Jove, of course. It's the establishment of Lady Menu, wife of the Earl of Menu. It was through that window up there that her second son, the Honourable Ronald Adair, was shot by Colonel Moran's famous air gun. This time it's her oldest son, Lord Robert, who's missing. Is it any wonder the letter she sent me verges on hysteria? But you don't understand, Mr. Holmes. Robert is a most devoted son. He'd never leave me in my condition without some sort of explanation. Your condition, Lady Menuth? As you know, Mr. Holmes, I left my husband, who was governor of one of the Australian colonies, the year before last, to return home to England for an operation for cataract of the right eye. My second son and my daughter accompanied me. Uh, that operation, I believe, was a complete success. It was, Mr. Holmes. But my son's tragic death and the knowledge that my left eye was also affected and in due time would have to be operated on left me in a horrible state of nervous depression. Understandable, eh, Holmes? Yes, quite. Uh, so, as the time for my second operation approached, my husband insisted that our oldest son, Robert, should be here with me. How long has he been in London, Lady Menuth? Less than a week. Hardly time for him to get into any scrape with the usual bad company. Oh, it couldn't be anything of that sort, Dr. Watson. Robert is too shy and, well... Perhaps fastidious is the word. He much preferred to spend an afternoon in the British Museum or the National Gallery than galloping up and down Rotten Row or winking at pretty nursemaids in Kensington Gardens. Hmm, pity. A certain amount of kicking up of the heels in the young Lady Menuth is healthy. It prepares them for life. They learn what to beware of later on. Mr. Holmes, you terrify me. You, you don't suppose Robert has fallen into the clutches of one of those theatrical hussies at the Gaiety who are always marrying young men with titles? Now calm yourself, Lady Menuth. Granted your son will inherit a title, I hardly think enough coin of the realm goes along with it to interest one of the Gaiety girls. Am I right? Unfortunately, yes. That's why I'm so particularly worried about Robert. He's never had the handling of a large sum of money before. Before what? Before yesterday. I... Well, I feel I must have no secrets from you, Mr. Holmes, if you're to find Robert. I need money. Desperately. My second operation for cataract is to be performed by the famous eye surgeon, Sir Lionel Tupper. Oh, brilliant ophthalmologist. Best in the field. Don't interrupt, Watson. He is brilliant, Dr. Watson, but also frightfully expensive. His fee for my last operation was 500 guineas. Why, it's outrageous. But he's worth it. Every penny. Well, to make a long story short... I had no cash in hand. No possible way of raising any in the immediate future. So I gave Robert my pearls to pawn. It was yesterday afternoon. That was the last any of us saw of him. Hmm. Uh, pardon the question, Lady Minuth. They were valuable pearls? Oh, yes, Mr. Holmes. They were worth many times the 500 guineas I hoped to raise on them. I see. But, uh, pardon me, I see Parker the butler is motioning me from the front hall. 
I, uh, I think he has something to tell you. Another case of a seal of the upper classes gone wrong, eh, Holmes? Not necessarily, Watson, but quiet, she's coming back. Oh, Mr. Holmes, I'm so relieved. Parker tells me that Robert has just come in the back way and gone up to his room. Oh. I'm so sorry to have brought you out on a wild goose chase, but you can see there's no further need for you. On the contrary, Lady Minuth, unless I'm very much mistaken, this is the moment when there's the greatest need for me. Which is your son's room? First door left at the top of the stairs. Come along, Watson. Up we go. What's wrong, Holmes? What do you think is up? I may be wrong, but... No, the door's locked. You hear that, Holmes? Yes, Watson. It's not the first time we've heard that devil's tattoo. In heaven's name, what is it? The sound of heels beating against a closet door, Lady Maynooth. Your son has hanged himself. Oh, confound what? the explanations, Holmes. Help me break down the door. <laughs> There. He'll do. Phew, that was a narrow squeak, old man. Don't do it again. Oh, Robert, Robert, how could you? I'm sorry, Mother. I, I guess I'm just no good. I lost the money, Mother. The money they gave me for pawning your pearls. There's nothing to pay for your operation. What does it matter? Nothing. Nothing counts but having you safe and sound again. How did you lose the money? At, at cards, Mr. Holmes. I guess I'm not as good a whist player as I thought I was. You young scoundrel. You mean you took the money for your mother's operation and gambled it away? But I had to believe me. It was the only way. At Sartorius and Fletcher's, the, the, the money lenders, where I went to pawn the pearls, I was ushered into the office of Mr. Juan Sartorius himself when they found out it was the minute necklace I had in my pocket. Well, when I entered the door, the old boy was friendliness itself. He, he stood back at his desk, bowing and wringing his fat little hands. And when I pulled the pearls out of my pocket, he almost snatched at them. I, his hand fairly shook as he adjusted his jeweler's eyeglass to one shiny black eye. Mm, beautiful. But yes, they are beautiful. And so perfectly matched. Tell the Lady Maynooth I shall be very generous. To her, I shall offer 7,000 guineas for her pearls. But, uh, Mr. Sartorius, I'm afraid you don't understand. No? The pearls are not for sale. I couldn't sell them if I wanted to. You see, they are part of the estate, and as such are entailed. In that case, I'm not interested. But uh, surely a slight loan. It's only for a short time. Until the rents from our Lancaster properties are due. My mother must have that operation. Tell her to wait till the rents are paid. But she can't, don't you understand? A delay may leave her blind. Oh, please, can't you let me have the money? It's only 500 guineas. I'll pay any rate of interest. Young man, you touch my heart. I give you 200 at 15%. 200? But I need five. I must have it. 300, then. But that's the last word. 300? What? What good is 300 in my position? You are a man of the world, I believe. You belong to clubs, no? Seems to me I hear you're a good whist player as your brother before you. All the menus have what is called the card sense, no? Yes. Well, that is, I suppose so. I, I always manage to win a bit. But I never played for high stakes. Why not, you idiot? A young man with a 300 guinea nest egg who understands cards, can do very well for himself, no? Oh, Robert, you didn't go to one of those whist clubs. Yes, Mother. Uh, I chose the Bagatelle. The Bagatelle? Merciful heavens! That's where your brother met that dreadful Colonel Moran, who caused his death. But, Mother, that was an unfortunate exception. Why, the Bagatelle is a gentleman's club. They're famous for having the most brilliant, but most honest games in all London. And besides, you know the old saying, lightning never strikes twice in the same place. But in your case, it did, Lord Robert. <laughs> well, yes, I, I'm afraid so. You had a particularly bad run of cards? No, I can't even claim that. Then there was no crooked dealing? Oh, good Lord, no. It was just that 
Well, nothing seemed to work out for me. While your opponent's hands dovetail perfectly. Eh? That's about the size of it, Mr. Holmes. You played a set game? Oh, no, sir. We cut for partners after every rubber. And who was the big winner? Well, it was uh, uh, Mr. Horatio Webster. If he'd been able to see straight through the cards, he couldn't have had better luck. Oh, yes, Mr. Horatio Webster. Double or nothing, Webster. He'd rather gamble than eat, I understand. So would I if I had his luck. I wonder if it's all luck. No one's luck can be as good as Mr. Webster's unless he sold his soul to the devil. That uh, wouldn't be a metaphor for su suggesting the gentleman isn't entirely honest. Go to the head of the class, Watson. But we can't prove anything. What can I do? Just this. See that Watson and I are presented with visitors' cards to the bagatelle. I rather think we'd enjoy an evening at the tables. Holmes, have you taken leave of your senses? You haven't played whist for over a year. Even so, my dear Watson, I fancy I may be able to teach Mr. Double or Nothing Webster a trick or two. After all, Holmes, why I have to crawl into this, into this high collar and a stiff shirt and just to spend the evening playing cards is more than I can... Well, stop spluttering, Watson. The Bagatelle is a very elegant establishment. We must live up to the tradition. Bother that. What's more, I, I can't say I look forward to having you as a partner for the entire evening. Come now, Watson. My method of playing whist may be unorthodox, but uh, it is rather brilliant. Possibly, but it's enough to give your partner nervous prostration. You play every game as if it were poker. Now, please, Holmes, promise that tonight you won't bluff. I'll try to control myself, Watson. Now, where did I put my lucky shilling? Yes, I just remember we've drawn every cent we have in the world out of the bank in order to have this fling. Don't be so conservative, Watson. We may lose a bit of our nest egg during the course of the evening, but don't let it upset you. Before the game's over, we shall have won back not only our losses, but enough to pay for Lady Maynooth's operation as well. What makes you so sure of that? This shilling. My lucky shilling. I can't possibly lose with that on my side. Pretty, isn't it? Hmm. Where did you get that silly thing? You never carried a pocket piece before. Never needed one before. Then how do you know it's so lucky? I've been working on it all afternoon. A gin and tonic for Dr. Watson, Pomfret, a scotch and soda for Lord Beavers, and another for me. And a brandy for Mr. Holmes. Double brandy, Pomfret. It's indeed a pleasure to welcome you to the Bagatelle Club, Mr. Holmes. I've heard so much about your mental prowess, I admit I'm prepared to spend a very unprofitable evening. Uh, shall we cut for deal? Your own reputation is fairly colourful, Mr. Webster. They say you've cornered the market on fortuity. <laughs> uh, Watson has an ace. Uh, in this club, the ace is low. Dr. Watson gets the deal. Uh, if you will each uh, shuffle the cards, gentlemen. Mr. Holmes first. You next, Lord Beavers. But poor old Beavers is quite deaf, you know. Fortunately, it doesn't affect his card sense. Oh, now my shuffle. And now the dealer. Ah, oh, here are drinks. Your cut, Mr. Webster. Oh, yes, with pleasure. There, deal them out. May the best team win. Shall we play a set game, gentlemen, or shall we cut or rotate after every rubber? Oh, by all means, let's stay where we are. I'm not the athletic type myself. I loathe a lot of bobbing about. Too much like playing musical chairs. <laughs> ah, spades are trumps. Lead, please. And that gives us three tricks, which means game and rubber. Uh, not to mention a four on account. Mm, that's, uh, let me see. Yes, you each lose another two pounds, eleven and sixpence, gentlemen. Mm, dear me, so we do, eh, Watson? Oh, settle up, old chap, that's a good fellow. What? I'm afraid all I have in my pocket's my lucky shilling. Doesn't seem to have brought you much luck so far, Holmes. Give it time, Watson. Give it time. Uh, Pomfret, Mr. Holmes's glass is empty. Thank you, Pomfret. Uh, cut, please, Mr. Holmes. Thank you. I hope you don't mind the way old Pomfret hangs around the table. He's been a waiter here for 40 years. The game still fascinates him. Yes, so it seems. Ever try a hand at it himself? Good Lord, no. He doesn't know one card from another. Ah, 
clubs a trump this time, gentlemen. Four more points for our side. Well, I'm afraid that's another rubber for us. You better throw away that lucky shilling, Mr. Holmes. Oh, what's that, Pompert? Uh, the same all round. Uh, Pompert has indicated the bar is about to close. Oh, great Scott, is it that late? You sure you wouldn't like to quit, Mr. Webster? Not me, as long as my luck holds out, Mr. Holmes. Of course, if you've had enough... Oh, not at all. We haven't even started to warm up. Eh, Watson? Warm up? Really, Holmes, the way you're playing tonight. Twice you've trumped a good trick of mine. And that last lead, what in heaven's name was that? My dear Watson, don't tell me you didn't recognize it. That's the new American lead. Fourth from your longest and strongest suit. Oh. Very ably explained in the little treatise by Mr. Nicholas Browse Trist of New Orleans, USA. Oh, to blazes with Mr. Trist. That gives us another game in rubber. It's getting to be positively monotonous, eh, Watson? Holmes, have you any idea how much we've lost during the night? Vaguely, Watson, oh, vaguely. Con confound that flash. Go away! Yes, it's getting to be daylight. Even the flies are waking up. Uh, sure you don't want to call it quits? Uh, just one more rubber. One more loss and we'll be cleaned out, Holmes. Oh, very well, Watson. Before that happens, I'll make you a little side bet. Uh, put a shilling on the table in your corner. Now, I'll put my lucky shilling here in mine. I'll bet you a guinea that fly lights on my shilling before he does on yours. again over in my corner. That's a good chap. <laughs> mm, that makes ten guineas I owe you, Watson. Yes. Hello, here comes another fly to get in the game. Perhaps he'll bring me luck. I doubt it, but let's get on with the rubber. It's my deal, I believe. Oh, it's funny how the last rubber is always the longest. I say, Mr. Holmes, I wonder if I could enter a shilling on your sweepstakes. Why, certainly, Mr. Webster. But in that case, I think I'll turn my coin over just for luck. Your shuffle, I believe, Mr. Webster. Yeah. <laughs> Coy little beggar, that fly. Nearly had him on my coin that time. No, by Jove, he's lit on yours, Mr. Holmes. Hmm, perhaps my luck has changed, at last. His five guineas says it hasn't. Fair enough. I'm out. That's too steep for me. Cut, Mr. Webster. Thank you. By Jove, look at the silly little buzzer. Oh, you win again, Mr. Holmes. How about another go at it? Same stakes. Delighted, Mr. Webster. Have you ever thought this to yourself? How can I get the advantages of group buying and still trade at the local independent store I trust? Well, the answer is really a very simple one, for through the amazing Clippercraft plan, we've made it our business to bring you remarkable values in clothes at the local store of your choice. It took real planning to accomplish this, and here's what happened. The Clippercraft plan concentrates the buying power of 1036 stores from coast to coast bringing you beautifully tailored Clippercraft suits at only $40 and $45, top coats and overcoats at only $40, and sport jackets at only $26.50. Yes, selling expensive clothes at inexpensive low prices at the nation's finest independent stores is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. These leading stores in the metropolitan area are proud to add their names to Clippercraft in your suit, top coat, and overcoat. In Manhattan, John Wanamaker Men's Stores, Broadway at 8th and 67 Liberty Street, Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th, in Brooklyn, Abraham and Strauss, in Newark, New Jersey, Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, and in Jamaica, the B&B Clothes Shop, 
16408 Jamaica Avenue. And now let's return to the Bagatelle Club, where Holmes is trying to lure a fly with his lucky shilling. Confound it. You win again, Mr. Holmes. That makes 200 guineas you owe me, Mr. Webster. Shall we say double or nothing? Sold. Oh, gentlemen, let's not forget there's a whist game going on. That's right you are. Ah, hearts are trump. Your lucky suit, I believe, Watson. By the way, did you know that of the original name for trumps is triumphs? Ah, there's the little beast on my coin again. That makes 400 guineas you owe me, Mr. Webster. I'll double the bet, Mr. Holmes. If you like. Holmes, are you out of your mind? You've nearly won back our losses. As I was saying, trumps were once called triumphs. That's what Shakespeare's alluding to in Anthony and Cleopatra when he says, She, Eros, has packed cards with Caesar and false played my glory unto an enemy's triumph. Act 4, scene 12. Confound it, Holmes. The fly has chosen your coin again. That's 800 you owe me. Ugh. The usual, Mr. Webster? Double or nothing? Holmes, are you out of your senses? It suits me, Mr. Holmes. I figure the law of averages must break in my direction for a change. Nice little fly. Careful now. There's 1,600 guineas riding on you, old chap. Careful, Watson, don't revoke. Oh, confounded, Holmes, how can I keep my mind on the game with a 1,600 guinea bet on the table? Just follow suit, Watson, just follow suit. Oh, confounded, will that fly never light? Patience, Mr. Webster, patience. The history of the game called whist is rather colourful, you know. The earliest form was called rough and honours. Holmes, did anyone ever tell you the word whist means hush or shut up? Pray do so. Sorry, Watson. Confounded, Holmes. The fly has chosen your shilling. And I take the final trick which makes game and rubber. The evening is finished, gentlemen. One moment, Mr. Holmes. Before I settle up, I'd like one look at that shilling of yours. Pleasure, Mr. Webster. Uh, careful of your fingers, though. It's slightly sticky. Sticky, by the Lord Harry. And sweet to the taste. I have been robbed. Holmes, you're a cheat and a thief. I refuse to pay my losses. Better Welsh on your debts, eh? I wouldn't advise it, you know. Really, I wouldn't. Or I shall be forced to report to the governors of this club that the Webster luck at cards is largely due to old Pomfret, the waiter. He stands behind your opponent's chair with his silver serving tray, angled in such a way that from where you sit, it mirrors every card in your opponent's hand. Well, that was a neat little trick on Holmes' part, Dr. Watson. Did Mr. Webster pay his debt? Oh, naturally. There was more than enough to cover Lady Maynard's operation and recoup our losses. But tell me, what was it Holmes had on his lucky shilling to attract the fly? A mixture of rum and sugar. Absolutely invisible, you know. It's an old trick invented by two famous racetrack touts in the 90s. When they had a particularly bad day at the track, they always managed to get into the same railway carriage with a heavy winner. Needless to say, by the time they'd reached London, the winner generally had empty pockets. And now, Dr. Watson, would you like to tell us what story you have in store for us for next week? Mm, now, let me see. Well, next week, I think I'll tell you a story that began with a young man in a gory bandage who collapsed on my waiting room floor, and which ended with Holmes finding himself in the tightest spot, literally as well as figuratively, of his entire career. Sounds promising, Dr. Watson. What do you call the story? The Adventure of the Engineer's Thumb.